Hi, I'm Susan Colley, and welcome to your Disability Connection. A few years ago, we had a show on the Perkins Braille and Talking Book Library. Here to speak again about the library with a reminder of their services, as well as discussing new offerings, is Erin Fregola, Library Outreach Coordinator. Hi, Erin. How are you? Hi, I'm well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Susan. Oh, you're welcome. We'll start out by asking who is eligible for uh, becoming a member of the Perkins Braille and Talking Book Library? That is a great, great question. Um, there is a lot of people who do not realize that they are in fact eligible. Um, well, a lot of times when people hear the name Perkins, they associate vision loss. And of course, vision loss is the number one reason why people are referred to us, mm -hmm. specifically macular degeneration, which is vision loss due to age. Um, however, there are many other people who would also be eligible. Um, that can include MS or Parkinson's or cerebral palsy or someone who's had a stroke or head trauma or someone who has severe arthritis or is missing a limb or in general has difficulty holding a book and turning pages and reading comfortably for an extended period of time. Um, all of those individuals would be able to get signed up either with our library here in Massachusetts or if they were in another state or if they moved or went on vacation they could also continue to re receive services from their own state. And um, in re reference to that, uh, do, you, uh, do you foresee that um, people won't apply for it because the fact that they don't think they're eligible? Yes, yes. Unfortunately, there, there are a lot of people that are not uh, aware that they would be eligible for these services. and. Um, we're doing our best to change that. We have created several different projects um, uh, in the past few weeks, which will be going on into 2019, including uh, radio and television and uh, other advertisements on social media, um, explaining to people um, all of the services which are available through the NLS and to whom these services are available to. Um, originally, um, the whole project, the NLS, was first created to help veterans who had lost their, their eyesight in war. Oh. Um, and then over time, over the decades, more and more people who would be otherwise be eligible, but they were not veterans, or they didn't lose their eyesight in battle, but they lost it afterwards. Um, there was this huge resource of uh, a wealth of information which was available for people to access if they um, had requested it. So more and more people started finding that they were um, becoming eligible as the NLS started expanding the definitions for who was able to sign up with us. And now okay. um, children, people of any age, veteran or not, are eligible to sign up for the services and can receive them directly through the mail without needing to come to Watertown or any other NLS library to receive them. As long as a physician or somebody like yes. that okay is it? Yes, there is a vetting process and that is the application. Mm -hmm. um, it is not difficult to complete, but we do our best to try to make sure that as many people as possible um, have the resource and the knowledge on getting it completed. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a free service. Everything is completely free. In order to get into the service, though, in order to be signed up at the library, you do need to complete an application. The application does need to be authorized um, by someone who would be able to um, distinguish, to be able to determine if somebody would be eligible for these reasons: uh, blindness, a visual impairment, or a physical disability. And in some instances, even reading disabilities such as dyslexia are eligible for um, somebody to get signed up at the library. Right. Um, so that's the, the vetting process. A doctor, a nurse, a social worker, a caseworker, a, a, a librarian, uh, a teacher, an occupational therapist, um, uh, many people would be eligible to, to sign up somebody because of vision loss or a physical disability. Uh, for reading disabilities, it does need to be diagnosed, which means that a medical doctor would need to um, be the person to authorize the application if it were um, right. checked off as a reading disability. Right, and um, you had mentioned earlier to me that autistic children or autistic adults can qualify. In and of itself, autism alone is not unfortunately a reason for somebody to be um, uh, eligible. However, there are many conditions which um, can involve autism that would make somebody eligible. Um, the point of the library isn't to turn away people um, who would be in need of these services. Mm -hmm. um, the point is to find ways that we're able to um, meet the requirements and make sure that the people who are best benefited by these services have access to them. Okay. Um, so in and of itself, autism alone is not a reason why. Okay. But if somebody feels as though they would be benefited by it, please reach out to the library, contact us, um, contact me directly if you'd like, and I'll do everything I can to, to, to work within the system to make sure people are getting services that they need. 
Okay, that's great. Now, uh, what are the actual benefits of joining the library? Ooh, there's a lot. Um, you're a library patron for life once you get signed up with us. So even if somebody doesn't want to utilize the services right away, we have many, many students on campus who um, they, uh, parents have chosen to sign them up, even though they may be too young to actually benefit from a lot of these resources. Mm -hmm. But they know that having access to this information as their child grows and progresses into adulthood, knowing that these resources exist and how to have access to them is immensely helpful. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other um, uh, advantages that we have for making sure that people are aware about these services is that it gives us an opportunity to share everything that we do. One of the challenges that we have is there is so much that the library offers that can be a little daunting, can yeah, be a little overwhelming sure. for somebody. Um, so giving them an opportunity to kind of ease them into these services gradually is helpful. There are many people who utilize their audiobooks. Um, that's, our, uh, that's our main service that we provide. We also have large print books that not everyone knows about. Oh, we have I a massive large print collection, which is actually so large it's housed in Worcester. But it also is shipped throughout the state. So if anybody actually wanted to um, or request a book from the library, from the, the large print collection, that'll be mailed to them. Wow. Um, so that is another service that people may not be aware of. Another benefit, though, is that especially with vision loss, there can be changes over time. And mm -hmm. somebody may find that they are decreasing in their usable sight. And hopefully somebody finds that they're no longer needing as much assistive technology as they go through surgeries or whatever right. um, hopeful right. um, opportunities they have. Um, we are able to grow and evolve with that. Mm -hmm. uh, depending upon what a patron needs, depending upon what their, their interests are, we're always able to improve upon that because people um, communicate with us. Okay. Now, how do you sign up for these services? I know you mentioned there's an application. Is there anything else they need to do? No. Um, if somebody were to uh, be lacking any um, authorization for that, that's really what the, 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 the challenge can be. Um, I'll tell you a very quick story. There was an optometrist who had um, felt that a, a woman who had lost her vision um, very suddenly, she lost about 80% of her workable vision wow. in less than a month's time. Oh, that's quick. She had macular degeneration and it, did, it had gone undiagnosed until she was starting to have severe vision loss. And because it had gone untreated, um, her vision loss was pretty subtle, or pretty sudden. Um, the doctor, the, the, the doctor that had diagnosed her had realized that our library could have benefited this woman hugely. So he gave her a business card and he gave her an application and he sent her on her way. Mm -hmm. She could not read the application to fill it out. She could not read the, the card to call us up. She had to ask a neighbor in her building to call the number on her phone so she can call, call me. I was able to help this woman out and I was able to also That's speak great. with the doctor's office and explain to them like you are an authorizing body. You would be able to sign up as many people as possible and it eliminates the step. Because otherwise, mm -hmm. she would need to go and find someone else to be able to authorize the application for her. And that is another um, important message that we have, is that if you are an agency which works with people who are eligible, uh, uh, hospitals, nursing homes, rehabilitation centers, schools, um, uh, a lot of these agencies can sign up people. There are many staff members that work at these agencies which can sign up people. So we do ask that um, uh, be aware about these services. If you do encounter somebody, if you know somebody who knows of somebody, share the information. It's, it's a free service that cannot um, be said enough nice things about on what we're able to do for people. Can you tell me a little bit about the lending process? Yeah, yeah. Um, so <laughs> depending upon what somebody would like to order from our library and how they're receiving information, um, that of course would, would be different. So if somebody wanted to order our books, I'll, I'll give right. you an example. This is one of our talking books right here. It comes in this blue case. Um, there is an address card on the outside of the case which has the patron's home address on it. Um, when somebody receives one of these in the mail, um, and let's back up a little bit. Let's say somebody wants to read this particular title. This is The Mystery right. of Hollow Places. They can either call up online, or they, they can call up the telephone directly, or they can go online, they can order a title, or they can even fax or email in a request to us. Mm -hmm. um, they can also have titles sent to them automatically based upon their interest. So they may not actually request this p particular title, but they may like uh, Rebecca Poto's books, um, or they may like this particular narrator, or this particular genre, um, mm -hmm. or any number of things. Um, so once this book arrives in the mail, they open it up, and inside is the actual cartridge. So the book is saved on this. This is essentially just a USB thumb drive. It's a hard bit of plastic with a little small hard drive inside of this mm -hmm. um, where a title is saved in an audible format. This is placed inside the talking book machine and the person would be able to listen to it. When they're finished listening to it, they would take the book out, they would put it back inside the case and seal it up. On the back side, there is an address card. On one side, the address card is the patron's home address. On the other side is our address. 
This goes back in the corner. It says right in the, in, the, uh, in the side of this, free matter for the blind or handicapped. There is no reason to pay for postage. Mm -hmm. um, another quick story, there was a woman, um, she had an adult daughter who had come out to visit her and the woman was a patron and she had uh, said to her daughter, she said, there's a box of books by the front entrance way. Can you please return those back to the library? So the daughter, with all the best intentions, took the box of books, sealed it, brought it, bound, brought, brought it down to FedEx, and then paid them um, to have it next day aired to us. Mm -hmm. um, I made sure to call up the woman and explain to her that uh, in the future, you don't pay for postage with our library. Um, if it's something that comes from our library, it ships to and from um, the patron completely free. Um, free matter for the blind means you don't pay for postage. Hmm. Um, now that's with the audiobooks. Um, if somebody, however, wanted to download an audiobook, you don't actually mm -hmm. need to return anything to us. Um, I'll go into that later, but the BAR does offer, it's an app that allows people to download material directly to their own device, so it's their device. They don't need to return it to us. To go back to the return and circulating of the materials, though, if it were large print, it would be much the same concept. You put it inside of a container, flip the address card over when you're finished with it, and you put it back in the mail, it comes back to us. Mm -hmm. DVDs, much in the same way if you were to check out an audio described DVD, when you're finished um, uh, watching the movie, you put it back inside the orange case that it came in, you turn the address card over and you send it back to us. Braille, much the same way. Um, these are large black containers, but same thing. You put them uh, inside the container when you go to return them, flip the address card over, it fits right into a US postal inbox. So the library does not cost anything at all, none of the services that well, you offer. Well, without cost doesn't mean free. And this is a clear indicator I like to, to make to people because it is a free service. Mm -hmm. But just like with every other library though, we are a service provided for by the state. So right. the state does provide us with a lot of funding in order to maintain. We also get um, a lot of donations from the community in order to make sure that we're able to continue to service people. Um, we're able to do an awful lot with what we have. Mm -hmm. um, there are always opportunities for us to advocate for the services that we provide. For people who are men members of the library, who are patrons of our library, we do ask that um, if you are using our service to, to speak up about it. Let people know that you're using the service and that you benefit from this. I hear on a daily basis from the people that I encounter about how they would not be able to live their life the way that they do if they didn't have access to our services. Well, like, yeah, it's very, it's very positive when you hear that, yes. you know, because I think there's so many people that could benefit from mm -hmm. it. The, the, the needs are so evolving, too, because not everyone that utilizes one service is going to need to use the other one. There are some people that they don't actually like the audiobooks themselves, but they use our service for Newsline, which is another amazing service which provides newspapers and magazines and even Sunday sectionals to people. And that's how they want to use the service. What matters most is that people talk to us. You let us know how we're able to help you. Um, uh, don't use everything that you don't want, but mm -hmm. just know that it exists. Right. The, the audio described DVDs, the Newsline services, uh, the Library Without Walls lecture series, um, the book clubs that we have. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's just so many resources, so many services that people don't know exist. Can you elaborate a little more about the um, online uh, process? Yeah, yeah. Um, so like for, for checking out books online? Mm -hmm. So if somebody had their own tablet or smart device, if you had a smartphone or a tablet or a computer, you would be able to download material directly to your device. If, however, you still prefer to use the talking book machine, these are incredibly accessible devices, um, very simple to use, very um, uh, tactile and uh, high contrast buttons make it very easy for people to see the, uh, the screens even with low vision. However, um, if you prefer to use this machine, but you do have your own computer, you could go online and request titles be sent to you on cartridge. Um, for anyone who would prefer not to use the computer, though, you can always call us up for that. Um, but going back to the BARD service, though, mm -hmm. um, the BARD service, it stands for Braille and Audio Reading Download. It's like Bard of Avon, like uh, Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. It's a little play on words. <laughs> yeah, they're clever. Um, so the BARD service actually is an app which can be downloaded on the Google Play Store or the um, uh, Apple Store. Mm -hmm. um, and then someone would be able to download from our entire collection. The same titles that we would send to somebody on a physical cartridge could also be downloaded online directly to their own device. And because it's their device, there's no reason to return it to us. Right. We do ask that people return the cartridges to us so that other people can check them out and enjoy the books and titles as well. However, if it's your device, Device, there are many people that they like to keep a religious um, tome with them, you know, the Bible or the Quran or, or, or you know, whatever um, religion they follow. Um, there's a lot of information that we have, and people could download that directly through the device, and then that's theirs to hold on to. They don't need to return it back to us. That's great. Yeah. Now, if a member requests a book, 
that is not in your library, do you then try to record it for them? We can. Um, there are instances. Now, um, there is a paid service. Now, to back up to what you said about it being free, there is mm -hmm. one opportunity for somebody. If we don't have the title available, we can, upon request, produce the title. That, however, there is a fee to that, though. That's only for special circumstances. If somebody has something that there's like a, like if it was a medical um, uh, uh, article or something that was very specific, it doubtfully would ever be included with the NLS. Mm -hmm. um, but we have had a number of people who have requested very specific pieces be recorded for them, um, in which case we would be able to do that. Yes, um, so to, the point that I wanted to make, though, there was um, the book that came out, Fire and Fury, um, the, mm -hmm. um, the book about um, uh, Donald Trump. Um, there was right. such a demand for that book. Yeah. When people learned that we were producing that title and they were able to go on to our website and see this book is in production, so many people contacted, not just our library, but every NLS library in the country was getting um, flooded with phone calls. When are you guys going to have this book available? The, the NLS expedited that book, and it was available within weeks. Normally it would wow. take much longer than that, but this was available within weeks <laughs> of the initial book release. I wonder why. <laughs> well, the, 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 if people are, are asking for something, our job is to provide the materials for them. And mm -hmm. the only way that we're able to do our job is if people communicate with us. Right. And sometimes I think a lot of patrons are fearful that, you know, I don't want to be a bother, I don't want to bother anyone over there. Um, but in all actuality, we do better by hearing from our patrons. It gives us... Um, uh, uh, more information about what materials people want and mm -hmm. how we're best able to provide it for them. So by all means, please contact us, let us know um, how we can improve or if we're doing a good job. We'd love to hear that too. Now, um, how do books become recorded and can anyone participate in that process? Not just anyone, but yes, we're always looking for volunteers to come down to the, to the library. Um, every um, book that we have, uh, I shouldn't say every, almost every book that we have did get produced by the NLS. There are books and titles which do get produced by individual um, recording studios. Not every state has its own recording studio, however. Perkins does. Mm -hmm. So we record a number of local interest titles. If they're a book that came out that was done by a, a, a Massachusetts author or about a Massachusetts subject, um, the NLS could very easily request that we do that for them, oh. um, including okay. publications like The New Yorker, um, the magazine. If anyone in the country were to read the New Yorker magazine from the NLS, it actually came from our recording studio. Um, uh -oh. Now about okay. the volunteer service though, mm -hmm. there is a vetting process. Um, we do welcome volunteers though for a variety of different um, uh, reasons. They are the backbone of what it is that we do. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, we receive some funding from the state, receive material from the NLS from the, from the Washington DC, but the volunteers really go above and beyond to making um, the needs of others um, so easily achieved. Um, so the recording process uh, does involve um, somebody coming in who is interested in being a, a narrator, um, and then if they have what it takes, if they have the, the right voice and the right disposition and the availability mm -hmm. too. Right. Um, what we can't do is we can't start a book and then halfway through the book recording process, if the volunteer no longer shows up and doesn't uh, um, come into any more recording, we have to scrap the project. Oh. So that can be because a little of, Because it's not continual. Yes, yes. There, there have been a few examples where we've had different um, speakers. Um, quick story, there was an author who was a local author um, uh, partway through the recording, he unfortunately passed away. Oh my goodness. Yes, he, 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 he had written his own book and he had narrated his own piece, but partway through it, um, he did pass. And unfortunately, um, because of that, it kind of put us in a situation. But thankfully, his son um, was able to come in and finish the recording. And there was an annotation added at the beginning of the recording saying that partway through it, um, you know, the, the author had passed away and his son is taking over. Right. But what we don't want to do is to leave everyone confused you mm -hmm. know, like, like all of a sudden the, the narrator changes, is this the same book I was reading? What happened? Is this a glitch? Mm -hmm. um, so consistently, cons consistency is huge for us, making right. sure it's the top, best quality product we can possibly release. Um, thank you for that. How long can you keep materials? We talked about that once, but yeah. um, again, why don't you refresh our memories? Sure, sure. So um, it's not an easy question to answer because it depends on what kind of material that we're talking about. If, as I said, somebody was checking something out from BARD, they can keep it as, as long as they want. It's indefinite. It's, it's your device. You are able to keep it there. If it's physical material that someone's borrowing, it depends on what the material is. For the most part, if it's a DVD, um, you can have it out for two to four weeks, and then we ask that somebody returns it back to us. Um, for the most part, everything else that we have can be checked out for six to eight weeks. Um, we do, in fact, though, not have a, um, a late fee policy. Um, what this means is that if somebody were to accidentally not return a title to us or it got misplaced, 
Um, no one is on the hook for any large fees or overdraft costs or anything like that. Um, what we do ask, though, is that patrons are respectful um, and that they be mindful about the needs of others as well and not to, to just right. amass a, a collection of books and never return them back to us. Eventually, we will need to have a conversation, but for the most <laughs> part, though, um, if somebody wants to check out the material, um, they're freely able to do that. Just make sure that you consider the needs of other patrons as well. Okay. Um, does the library um, um, lend out resource books? Uh, resource books as in like what? Um, reference books. Yes, like. yes. Um, so the library has a huge collection of resource guides um, which are provided for by the NLS and other state agencies. Um, oftentimes I will speak personally with a lot of these providers and these agency groups that are more than happy to share their information with us. Um, so if anybody has any specific questions, they can always contact the library. Um, and if we can't answer a very specific question for you, there's a really good chance we'll be able to point somebody in the right direction mm -hmm. um, to an agency or to a contact who would be best served um, in, in answering that particular point. Um, but at the library itself, though, um, uh, we do have a huge collection of resource guides which can pertain to students, it can pertain to adults, to people with disabilities, to people who are um, completely blind or someone who has vision loss, vision loss due to aging, um, uh, materials and resource guides for someone during an emergency situation. Um, all of this resource is geared towards helping and that's what it really comes down to. And if we can help somebody or if you feel that we can help somebody by providing something, um, contacting us and letting us know is, is really um, helpful for us in, in, in moving forward. Okay. Um, are materials only available through the Perkins Braille and Talking Book Library? So, no. Um, we are one of many NLS libraries in the country, and every NLS library um, has access to very much the same material. Um, our library, however, has a very um, old and very extensive Braille collection. We have over mm -hmm. eight miles of printed Braille in our basement. Wow. It, it's a huge collection. If ever, anybody ever wants to come down and take a tour, by all means, give us a call, schedule a time, come on out, we'll show you everything. It's, it's a phenomenal campus. Wow. Um, but yeah, um, the Braille collection is available for loan because it is so extensive to certain NLS libraries. And mm -hmm. I had mentioned to you before that we have other libraries which are in different states right. that also provide resource. Um, not every NLS library provides exactly the same resource. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain things which we're able to provide, such as uh, our extensive Braille collection, which some libraries are able to check out. Unfortunately, not every library in the country has access to our collection. Mm -hmm. um, there are other things which we also will lend out to people as well, which are exclusive um, really only to this state. Um, we have uh, an assistive technology long-term loan program. There are other agencies like uh, MAB, MCB, which can provide excessive uh, assistive technology like CCTVs or magnifiers. Mm -hmm. um, in this state, however, because of the number of people who um, recognize what it is that we do, um, and they make donations to our library of not just um, uh, you know, uh, literature or books or titles or braille, but also assistive devices. So mm -hmm. part of my job is to try to find homes for some of this technology. Now, if somebody were to go to another state in the country and look for something similar to this, right. I doubt that they'd be able to find it. Mm. Um, but for anyone who does need this, though, um, the Perkins Library does receive donated materials that we, in turn, try to find homes for in the community. Um, desktop CCTVs, um, digital magnifiers, magnifying lenses, eyeglasses, um, keyboards, assistive software. There's a fair amount. It's always changing, and there's no guarantee of anything being readily available. Um, but it is a great place to start, especially for somebody on a fixed income. The first step is right. to be signed up with the library. You have to be a patron of the library, but it's free to get signed up. Right. Um, it's just a way for us to be able to measure and to gauge um, uh, how effective or how efficient our services are and how we're able to help people. Who are we able to help? Right. Um, this is very helpful information for us to be able to, to gauge. Um, so that's the reason why we have the, uh, the sign up process for this. Mm -hmm. But once somebody is signed up with the library, they're free to check out whatever available materials that we have. That's great. Now, are there any changes that have been made in the past few years uh, to enhance services? Yes, yes, a, a fair number. Um, there you was, have some things right I, there. I do, I do. Um, so I'll start with the newest thing that we have, and I'll move along. So this right here is a remote control, and you'll notice this has a lot of very similar buttons to the Talking Book machine. Um, however, this has a few advanced features as well, which um, would be used with an advanced machine. So chapter navigation, 
um, as well as info and uh, the menu button are options on the remote control which are not on the standard machine so they wouldn't apply. Um, if somebody had say MS or Parkinson's or had severe arthritis or had some condition which made movement difficult for them, mm -hmm. um, these devices are very accessible. However, the buttons are a little spaced apart. Mm -hmm. um, that could be a challenge for some people. So for those who may need a little bit more, there is the remote control. Uh, there is a dongle which attaches to the USB port on the side and that allows them to control all of the buttons of the machine using only the remote control. That's excellent. Yeah, yeah this is a new offering that we have. Um, it is um, um, becoming more needed, unfortunately. Um, as we're seeing, there are more and more people who and it is a good thing, though. I think there's a lot of people who are benefited by these services who in the past had not realized that they would be um, uh, able to access them. Uh, right. I've spoken to a number of people at stroke support groups, and they've had challenges. Um, mm -hmm. Having this type of technology available to them um, uh, helps to eliminate some of those challenges. There's, That's great. There's not, there, unfortunately, there's nothing we can really do for everyone, but right. we do our best to try to reach um, and, and help well, those I think you're doing a great way. job. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, so yes, this is the remote control. Um, this is another device. Um, this is called a breath switch. Um, it's kind of hard to see. Um, there's another part to this that I don't carry around with me all the time because it's basically just clear medical tubing. Um, but this part right here would attach onto someone's lapel and the medical tube would connect to the USB port on the side here and allowing somebody to use their breath, they're able to control all the functions of the machine. Um, there is a bit of a learning curve to it, of course. Oh, it, sure. it, it, it does require them to, to memorize the patterns for it, but somebody could very easily control and manipulate this machine and give themselves back that control over the, their life, give themselves the ability to decide what I want to listen to at mm -hmm. any given time. And we've spoken before, I've, I've spoken to my director about this. If somebody were in need of this, we would be happy to compile collections for that type of person. Most That's of the time, great. it's one book per cartridge, and it just makes it easier for us to do that. But mm -hmm. um, our, our director, Kim Charlson, who has appeared in the past, I've spoken to her in the past, and she has said that under those circumstances, we'd be more than happy to compile a collection because the one thing that this switch doesn't allow somebody to do, unfortunately, is to physically remove and reinsert a new cartridge. Right. So that's the one limitation that this machine has. If we mm -hmm. can jam pack a book full of titles, that person would not need to rely upon somebody else to get entertainment and to get enjoyment out of their days. So wow. that is a huge, huge, uh, an important facet of mm -hmm. the breath switch, is giving somebody control over their life. Um, another method of making the machine more accessible for a variety of reasons is this device, which is called a pillow speaker. Um, it's a little, <laughs> it's actually, it's called a pillow phone, but I find that to be a little misleading, so I like to say it's the pillow speaker. Basically, it looks like a hockey puck, and there are audio ports on the outside. Um, there's nothing on the top or the bottom. So this could actually go underneath someone's pillow. If they were bedridden, if they had a hard time sitting up in bed, or if movement was an issue for them, this would allow them to listen and continue to listen to the books without disturbing their partner or their roommate. Um, wow. It's a much quieter method of listening to the machine while still being able to hear uh, the books. Wow, that's great. One other device that we have, which is actually not provided for um, through the NLS. This is actually provided for by the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. Mm -hmm. um, but this is the iBill. This is a currency reader, which is made by a manufacturer, the Orbit, reader, uh, Orb Orbit Research, which is actually the same company that is now making our refreshable Braille reader. Um, and I can go to that in a, in a few minutes. Um, but Orbit Reader, uh, sorry, Orbit Research created the iBill, which is a currency reader, which helps determine one denomination bill from another here in this country. Unfortunately, we don't have tactile currency yet. Mm -hmm. um, in 1996, I believe, is when the Americans with Disability Act came into play. Um, and what that said was that all government agencies were required to provide accessible materials to people with disabilities. Right. And the Bureau of Engraving and Printing was no exception. Mm -hmm. So they originally had a timeline which would have put us at 2017 to mm -hmm. have accessible tactile currency. Right. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have it yet. We're still in the process of getting that, but it, it's a, it's a slow-moving process. We want to make sure it's done right. Right. Um, so in the interim, in the meantime, though, the currency reader, which was at one point in time sold for $100 a piece, this is now free. So if you're part of our library and you could use one of these, please call us. We're able to do the paperwork for you. If you're not part of our library and you could use one of these machines, you can contact the Bureau of Engraving and Printing and they can um, send you an application. You complete the application much in the same way somebody would get signed up with us. Right. Um, we kind of go around the vetting process for the currency reader because once somebody signed up with our library, they're signed up 
um, and eligible for other services. Right. Um, so the currency reader, it does operate with a single AAA battery. Um, there is um, audio uh, input as well as tone. I'm um, sorry, output. Audio output as well as tone and vibrate too. Wow. So if somebody, I'll just hit the button. So this is set to vibrate. And what this will allow is for somebody who is in a noisy environment or someone who is uh, deaf or hard of hearing, if they have a hard time telling what the machine is reading aloud to them, uh, this will give them still feedback, haptic feedback, that will mm -hmm. tell what the, the domination is. And if you want to change it, and I'll give you a quick crash course, there's a button on the bottom, there's a button on the top to change the settings, you press and hold down on one, and you press the other one and you cycle through. And that's how you would change the settings. Well, I thank you very much for joining us today. We've learned a lot. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. You're I, welcome. I really appreciate this. Okay. Um, Perkins Braille and Talking Book Library is an excellent resource for those who are blind and others who have difficulty reading. Make sure you check it out. Till next time on your Disability Connection.